4. Goodwin Sands One of the most dangerous stretches of sand in Britain is located six miles off the coast of Deal in East Kent, England. The dunes provide a significant obstacle to navigators since they're situated in the midst of the English Channel in the narrow Straits of Dover, close to one of the world's busiest shipping channels. More than 2,000 ships are said to have wrecked on Goodwin Sands since the first one was recorded in the year 1298. Under the surface, many wrecks are still present. Although the Goodwin Sands are roughly 10 miles long and 3 miles wide at its widest, the shoals are continually shifted by the currents and tides. For the majority of the time, the sand sits beneath the water at a depth between 26 and 49 feet. The sandbanks, however, break the surface as the tide recedes. When this happens, the sand becomes firm enough to walk on. Normally, a ship would run into the sand during choppy weather and would start to break apart. If you were to survive this, it's advised that you start a fire to attract passing ships in order to request assistance. Sadly, the sand turns into quicksand when the tide changes, devouring the ship and her crew if help doesn't come within a few hours. The Great Storm of 1703 had the worst death toll of any incident that's occurred here. A total of 2,168 people lost their lives when at least 40 commercial vessels and 13 men of warships capsized in the Downs. Local divers stumbled upon the HMS Stirling Castle, one of the vessels that was lost that night, in 1979. An East India Company ship called the Admiral Gardner sank in January 1809 and is among the other noteworthy disasters that occurred in the Goodwin Sands. It was loaded with 48 tons of company coins, and the rest of its cargo consisted of iron, weapons, and anchors. Amazingly, around 1 million coins were collected from the wreckage by divers in 1984. With a 300-meter exclusion zone surrounding its wreck site, Admiral Gardner is now a protected area. Modern ships are now able to avoid the Goodwin Sands thanks to new cutting-edge navigational equipment, many of which are aided by GPS and comprehensive channel mapping. The last major accident to occur here was when a light ship capsized in 1954. 3. The Great Blue Hole There's a sinkhole that's almost 400 feet deep in the Gulf of Aqaba. It's located north of the Red Sea and is situated between Dahab, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. It's called the Blue Hole, and it's one of the most stunning yet dangerous diving locations in the world. The number of people who have died here isn't known, however, it's estimated to be around 200. Because of this, diving is prohibited in the Blue Hole unless you're an experienced and qualified diver. According to a handful of experts, some of the deaths that have occurred here are the direct result of the diver's overconfidence, and they say that the Great Blue Hole doesn't deserve a bad reputation. They reported that even the most advanced divers can make mistakes, and if one is made while in the Blue Hole, almost nothing can be done to save them. Some people believe that the Blue Hole shape plays a big role in the number of accidents that have been linked to it. Divers have often claimed to observe light emanating from a large tunnel located around 300 feet below the surface. Some divers have even made the mistake of swimming downward toward the light instead of upwards because they thought it was the sun on the surface of the water. Nitrogen narcosis can be a serious outcome because of this, a severe threat for divers. Even professional divers can't escape it, like Yuri Lipsky. His death was caught on camera, making it the most famous blue hole fatality of all time. Nitrogen narcosis is an effect that's created when a person inhales nitrogen under increased amounts of pressure. About 78% of every breath you take is made up of nitrogen, which generally passes through the body without having any obvious impact. But there's just one issue with that. Nitrogen and oxygen don't get absorbed by the body the same way. A person can't breathe underwater unless the water and air are at the same pressure. The air has to be four times as dense when you're 100 feet below the surface, and the consequences usually get worse the deeper you go. Lightheadedness, numbness, carefreeness, and even euphoria have been some of the reported symptoms of nitrogen narcosis. Unfortunately, these often lead to more serious symptoms, such as irrational behavior and slowed critical thinking. The type of water a diver is in typically affects what happens next for them, while those in colder, darker water frequently report experiencing dread and worry. 
those in warm water describe feeling comfortable and calm. However, almost everyone has reported that the effects are similar to being intoxicated, no matter what the temperature of the water is. In order to prevent the effects of nitrogen narcosis, many divers opt to use helium during prolonged dives. It's a great substitute for nitrogen because it's another inert gas that doesn't absorb right away. The spectacular tunnel of the Great Blue Hole is situated 300 feet below the surface. But at 184 feet, just over halfway to the tunnel, oxygen may turn hazardous. It performs poorly under severe pressure and will rapidly harm the body. To dive that deep, a person needs a certain mixture of gases. Those who face problems with oxygen while diving have likely encountered the condition known as hyperoxia. This can result in disorientation, breathing problems, and nearsightedness. However, with the proper equipment, the chances of getting it are rare. It's only safe to dive into the blue hole if you've already taken the necessary precautions. The two most important things to remember before visiting this place is to prepare the right gas mix and to know how to adapt to increasing pressure underwater. Would you take the risk and dive into the Gulf of Akaba's Great Blue Hole? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. 2. Cape Horn Cape Horn is notorious for being incredibly dangerous. But for many early explorers, it was the only way they could get from one hemisphere to the other. It's been long recognized as the only route around South America. Dutchman Willem Schouten was the first person to travel around Cape Horn in 1616. It's been called a few names throughout the years, such as the Dutch town of Horn, and in Chile, the Spanish refer to it as Capo de Horno. The Drake Passage, a 500-mile-wide section of water that's notorious for its strong winds, chilly temperatures, and dramatic wave patterns, was used by the majority of explorers to round the Cape. Because it provides the maximum room for navigation despite the hazardous circumstances, the passage's width is what makes it so popular with travelers. The waters have taken the lives of several explorers and numerous ships over the years, as well as mariners with different levels of experience who've tried or attempted to complete this trek in the past. The Beagle Journey, on which renowned scientist Charles Darwin traveled, is one of the most well-known expeditions that's been reported. He too described the perilous route and dangerous conditions that are so often heard of in this stretch of water. Jean-Francois de Gallop La Perouse embarked on a journey of exploring and mapping in 1785 that took him to South America's southernmost point. He was one of the fortunate sailors who survived the voyage at the time, and he went on to discover and chart a large portion of the globe, from the coast of North America to Russia and Japan. Unfortunately, he subsequently lost his life when his ship went down in the Pacific Ocean when he was returning from Australia. The perfect storm of maritime risks may be seen at Cape Horn. The icy waters and high winds frequently combine to create turbulent seas. The seabed's also rather peculiar. Over a short distance, it rises rapidly at South America's southernmost point, going from 13,200 feet to barely 330 feet. Massive breaking waves result frequently from this abrupt transition. As waves travel through the sea, their contact with the rising ocean floor creates drag, which speeds up the wave's upper half. As a result, the seas have become exceedingly choppy in this area. These turbulent waters, coupled with the strong westerly winds, make navigation through the Drake Passage and the Cape Islands extremely hazardous. Stray icebergs from Antarctica are another navigational risk that can be encountered in this stretch of water. Navigation around Cape Horn is exceedingly challenging due to the terrible loss of many lives and ships. But luckily, a newer, more secure route, the Panama Canal was opened in 1914. Even though it hasn't been necessary since it was created, occasionally ships still navigate the waters off Cape Horn. 1. Broomway Foulness Island, located on the estuary of River Roach in Essex, England, has been under military control for a very long time. The War Office initially built an artillery range on the island in the middle of the 19th century and is currently operated by the Ministry of Defense for the testing of new weapons and ammunition. The island is perfect for this because it's situated far away from densely populated areas. This place is truly unique and is almost uninhabited. 
Very few people live here, but those who do share it with guided missile systems, explosive shells, and killer grenades. When they aren't dealing with the dangers of the island, the people living here plant peas, linseed, wheat, and barley. For a long period of time, Faunus Island was only accessible by ferry, or when the sea went out, a walk could be taken down the tidal flats of Maplin Sands. It's known as the Broomway, and many consider it to be the most dangerous path in Britain. It starts at a place called Wakering Stairs, and then it stretches its way east heading straight into the sea. The direction changes to northeast after only 1,312 feet. Then, for roughly five miles, the path is directly aligned with the coast. After that, the broomway heads to the tip of the island, an area known as Fisherman's Head. Most seem to have no issues on the walk if the weather is good. However, many experience the effects of the relentless incoming tides. The waters rush in so quickly, you'll have water up to your neck before you even know what's happening. Unfortunately, this has resulted in the loss of multiple lives. Although there's proof the broomway was used 600 years ago, when Roman settlements were found on Faunus Island, there's speculation that it was used much further back than that. It's been said that it may date back to Anglo-Saxon times, but it was subsequently flooded thanks to coastal erosion. According to archaeological research, the broomway was formerly strengthened with wooden hurdle work, at least in the southern part. To mark the broomway on maps, broomsticks with their bristles facing upwards were placed in the mud. And interestingly enough, that's how the route got its name. When the tide would retreat, writer Herbert W. Tompkins wrote that the brooms would lift their heads and appear as a line of black dots. This helped potential travelers choose when to start their journey. One of the worst dangers along the broomway is getting caught in an incoming tide. It's difficult to see the coast, so a traveler might easily become lost and wind up veering off the road if a storm comes through or if the island is covered in thick fog. As a result, you risk getting stuck in mud or quicksand. There's a very small window of time to return to land before the tide comes in, which unfortunately makes death a possibility. The firing range on Faunus Island is where the other danger lies. The military is responsible for the large craters that are formed on Maplin Sands and the Thames Estuary as a result of firing their artillery, which often explodes. After the tide comes in, it leaves behind soft mud that fills the craters and creates sinking sand pits. This poses a large risk because they can't be seen by the naked eye. If you walk into one, there's a possibility you might not walk out of it. The firing range also leaves exploded shells behind from time to time, which have the possibility of exploding at any time. In 1922, Bridges and a road that connected the island to wakering stairs were built by the military. Taking the broomway today isn't necessary. However, many people take the doomway, as locals call it, to get to Faunus Island because they're looking for adventure. If you survived a plane crash and were stranded in the middle of the ocean, would you rather float on your back until help arrives, or would you try to swim to safety, even though you don't know which direction to go in? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.